Welcome to the third webinar in the Health Inequalities series on maternal and ethnicity health inequalities. Um, I'm Rochelle Mahapatra, I'm based in the Leeds office of Owen Mitchell um, and I'm one of the medical negligence partners. Today I'm really pleased to be joined by um, Geeta Nea, um, who is one of our solicitors in our London office and she's also a council member for the MASIC Foundation. I'm also joined by Eddie Morris, who is an obstetrician um, and also a past president of the Royal College. Um, to, to introduce our first speaker today, Geeta um, is an advocate and strong campaigner for women with severe perineal and maternal injuries. Uh, Geeta was practicing as a lawyer in our London office when she um, had her first uh, child and unfortunately suffered from life changing injuries during that delivery. Um, she has worked closely with the MASIC Foundation ever since they were first set up um, and she now speaks widely about her experiences and provides support for women. Um, she recently um, returned to us, I'm pleased to say, and specialises in maternal injury uh, claims and works with charities and organisations to improve outcomes for women. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Geeta. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michelle. Good afternoon, everyone. Racial inequity in maternity care is now well documented, but what I would like to talk about today is a hidden taboo. A specific and devastating adverse outcome that disproportionately affects women from ethnic minorities. In fact, Asian women suffer the highest rate of this injury, OASI, obstetric anal sphincter injuries. Also known as severe perineal tearing, OASI do not just cause bowel incontinence, but other pelvic floor dysfunction, such as flatus and urinary incontinence, dyspenuria, perineal nerve damage, debilitating pelvic pain, pelvic organ prolapse, and rectovaginal fistulas. These are injuries that ruin women's lives. I'm a passionate advocate for women who have suffered maternal injuries and have become an expert in OASI because 14 years ago, this is exactly what happened to me. I would like to share with you today my lived experience to give you an insight into how, as a South Asian woman, I was affected, and more importantly, how we can support and prevent this from happening to other women. I qualified as a solicitor with Owen Mitchell in 2002. I specialised in both neurotrauma and medical negligence with a particular interest in spinal, brain injury and birth injury cases and worked extensively with charities and organisations that supported injured clients. I got married and was overjoyed to be expecting my first child in the summer of 2008. I painted the nursery a bright shade of yellow and my birth plan had been meticulously prepared. We were excited about what the future held. I went into labour on a Sunday evening and was booked into a busy teaching hospital. My midwife was calm and put us at ease. However, after several hours, it was clear that I was not progressing. I was exhausted with pain and started on syntocinin. This coincided with an evening change of shift, and it was at this point that things started to deteriorate. My newly appointed midwife had an inexplicably hostile attitude with me. Eventually, decelerations were noted and my concern turned to fear. I was in my most vulnerable state, worried about the safety of my daughter, but any requests to discuss options such as being moved to theatre were dismissed and ignored. The situation continued to deteriorate until there was marked fetal distress and what followed can only be described as a nightmare. Panic ensued. There were several failed attempts at Bontus, followed by an extremely forceful and traumatic forceps delivery. My daughter was born with deep lacerations to her face, which became necrotic. I sustained a 3 C tear involving the entire length of the external and internal anal sphincter and nerve damage. I was left completely traumatized by the experience. Instead of holding and feeding my daughter, I was taken to theatre for several hours for an attempted repair. This unfortunately failed, and I suffered my first episode of faecal incontinence the very next day. From this episode to date, I continued to be completely incontinent of faeces and flatus. 
have marked fecal urgency, passive fecal incontinence, urinary incontinence, extensive scar tissue and perineal pain. In the days that followed, we really struggled with feeding due to the injuries my daughter had. We later discovered she had a suspected fracture of the zygomatic arch. And subsequently, we had to be readmitted to the same hospital for several nights, which only compounded my trauma. Once discharged, there was absolutely no support. I saw my GP several times. He was empathetic at my horrendous symptoms, but didn't have any answers and never once suggested referring me to a perineal trauma clinic. I didn't know, I think, I don't think he knew they existed. I went from being a resilient, independent woman to needing significant help, in pain, having frequent bowel accidents. Whilst my friends were meeting in the park and attending baby groups, I was barely able to leave the house. I struggled on, but after several months, the situation was so dire, I moved in with my parents for support. I'm from a resilient and high achieving Indian family and the fact that I could not cope with the severity of my symptoms and being a new mother made me feel like an abject failure. Eventually, I was seen in the perineal trauma unit at St Mary's Hospital in Manchester. I underwent extensive endo anal investigations and was told for the very first time just how serious my injuries were involving pedendal neuropathy, and that my poorly attempted primary repair had completely failed. It was horrifying to hear, but also a relief to finally understand why my symptoms were so severe. Since then, I have undergone further surgical repairs, which have also failed, tibial nerve stimulation, irrigations, suppositories, enemas, plugs, medication, biofeedback, the works but I have simply had to adjust the way I live to cope. I have lost precious years to this injury and the ripple effect on my family and friends has been huge. Obstetric anal sphincter injuries affect one in 50 women in the UK, but this rises to over one in 20 women in first births. It is a secret epidemic. In 2015, I was contacted by Professor Mike Keithley to join a focus group looking at the impact of OASI. And in 2016, the Mazik Foundation was born. The Mazik Foundation is the only multidisciplinary UK charity to support women who have suffered severe perineal injuries during childbirth. And I am proud to work with them. Several years after my delivery, whilst undertaking research for Mazik, I came across statistics that documented ethnicity as a significant risk factor for OASI. It completely shocked and horrified me. In fact, Asian women have the highest risk of third and fourth degree perineal injuries. A 2019 paper in the International Urogynecological Journal puts the figure of Asian women sustaining OASI at 6.5 times higher than white women. A short perineum less able to stretch during delivery is one theory, but there is unbelievably very little research on it. It is just an accepted statistic. I was just one of those accepted statistics. If you ask any woman whether she would want to be told of a risk factor that may affect her six times as much, the answer would be a resounding yes. But this is not happening. The Black Maternity Experiences Survey by Five Times More identified that 40% of their respondents said they were not informed of their pregnancy risk status. Had my ethnicity been taken into account and I'd been told of my greater risk of perineal injury as a South Asian woman having her first child and that the healthcare professionals whose care I was under knew of these risks, I strongly believe the outcome would have been different and I would not have had to go through years of trauma and surgery and loss. I wanted to tell my story firsthand to explain the journey and difficulties I faced with severe perineal injuries. And that was despite being born in this country with a supportive family and a sound knowledge of the medical system. Now, imagine those difficulties being compounded 
by having a poor grasp of the language or living in a community where talk of issues such as incontinence is completely taboo. The cultural language and structural barriers to understanding and accessing adequate care can be insurmountable. This is exactly what happened to a tremendously brave woman I met in the Mazik Foundation support group, Rani. I, I've changed her name for confidentiality. Rani moved to this country with her husband in 2014 and quickly fell pregnant with her first child. Rani's English was very basic. Her husband was fluent in English and attended every antenatal appointment with her. Vital healthcare discussions were often directed towards him without checking to see if she had understood. No translator was ever offered to her. Rani was not able to communicate properly with her midwife during her labour. Eventually, there was an instrumental delivery, but she was distressed and she didn't understand the consent process. She didn't understand words such as forceps. Rani sustained a fourth degree tear, which was unfortunately not diagnosed. Once home, she experienced severe incontinence and was in chronic pain. Her husband was a domineering presence at both her health visitor and her six weeks checks, and discussions mainly focused on her baby and breastfeeding. After several months, Rani was desperate and built up the courage to go to her GP, where she asked to be examined by a female member of staff. She was shocked when her appointment was with a male GP. She couldn't discuss her pain on intercourse or fecal incontinence with a man. She felt ashamed. Her husband grew impatient and then angry and then violent that she could not return to a sexual relationship due to her injuries. He wanted her to have another child, but she couldn't imagine going through that trauma ever again. Rani was scared and isolated. She didn't know where else to go for help. She'd never heard of this condition before and no one talked about it in her community. She found leaving the house in her traditional dress, a sari, and having repeated faecal accidents just too difficult to manage. She lost her job. She was not able, even able to attend her local temple. She was considered unclean and couldn't risk having a bowel accident there. It would have brought shame on her family. There were so many missed opportunities to help her. Had her postnatal appointments been culturally sensitive, Rani could have been signposted to leaflets in her own language or told about groups that offered support from the same background and culture. Her silence was taken as permission to ignore her. Cultural assumptions were made. It was never questioned further that actually she was suffering and that she faced a huge stigma talking about her fecal incontinence, especially in front of her husband. She was dehumanized. The failure to recognise language difficulties is an overwhelming discriminatory factor which can lead to a lack of informed consent, a basic and fundamental right of every woman in childbirth. Rani didn't have a voice in her labour. After several years, Rani finally accessed a referral to St Mark's Hospital. Subsequently, she had a stoma fitted. 35% of women with a fourth degree tear have to face a stoma. However, she is still completely isolated from her community, whom she feels would not accept her with a stoma. I too felt isolated for many years. A recent survey by the Mazik Foundation found that 85% of women who sustained severe perineal injury so that it impacted on their relationship with their child and 50% of women stated they were unable to do normal day-to-day -day activities due to their injuries. A 2016 study by Professor Keith Lee et al. produced a unique word study depicting the OASIS syndrome. The size of the words on the, on the slide represent the emotional force of expression from the women. Suffering from faecal, urinary and flatal incontinence has devastating social, psychological and emotional consequences. Self-esteem, the ability to work and socialise, physical intimacy, social isolation, economic deprivation and comorbidity of psychosocial problems such as depression and anxiety and stigma are all widely reported. Sustaining these serious and often permanent injuries 
causes huge inequalities for women of all ages and ethnic groups. But add to that language barriers, cultural stigma and structural barriers. It is not surprising that women from ethnic minorities are slipping through the gap. The Maisic Foundation is calling for a comprehensive assessment for OASI injuries following all births, which will also help identify women who are less likely to report injuries due to cultural reasons. Female clinicians should be available for postnatal checks and women from ethnic minorities deserve to be educated and empowered antenatally about their increased risk for OASI. Recruitment of a diverse staff and advisory body is essential and training. Training on discrimination and cultural barriers. Training on preventing, repairing and recognising these devastating injuries. As highlighted by the groundbreaking work of organisations such as the Mazik Foundation, Five Times More, the Motherhood Group, Embrace and Birthrights, there needs to be a call to action individually and within all of our organisations to make women from ethnic minorities feel safe and heard within healthcare. My journey is continuing and I am no longer letting my injuries dictate my life. After many years simply coping, I returned to work at Owen Mitchell with a level of support and understanding I could never have imagined. I am using the expertise I've gained in this field to focus on working with maternal injury clients, charities and organisations to improve outcomes for those affected by these devastating injuries. Together, we can and must stop stories like mine and Rani's from happening again and shine a light on this hidden taboo. Thank you for listening. I'm now very pleased to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Edward Morris. Dr. Morris is Regional Medical Director for the East of England, a post he started in December 2022 following his three-year presidency at the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynaecologists. Dr. Morris, he took up his presidency in 2019 and during his time he covered the COVID-19 pandemic, rapidly producing the RCOG COVID guidance the call for workforce investment and the need to address health inequalities. Dr. Morris is a consultant in gynaecology at the Norfolk and Norwich University Hospital NHS Foundation Trust and honorary senior lecturer at Norwich Medical School, University of East Anglia. Dr. Morris authored over 150 peer reviewed articles, book chapters and national documents. He is co-editor of the journal Post Reproductive Health and inventor of the website Manage My Menopause. He is globally recognised for his work throughout his career in patient safety, standards and guideline production and medical device work with the MHRA. He was the inaugural chair of the RCOG Patient Safety and Quality Committee and chairman of the British Menopause Society 2013 to 2015. Thank you, Eddie. Thank you very much, Geeta. Thank you for that uh, very kind introduction. Um, but most of all, thank you for the strength uh, and fortitude that you've had in presenting your story to illustrate so powerfully um, the issues that we are here to discuss today. Um, it, it's through your voices and voices uh, like you that we can really advocate for change and let's hope that we can continue to do that. So thank you. I'm sure everyone out there feels exactly the same as, as I do. Uh, well, thank you for inviting me to talk, Owen Mitchell. Um, as you know, I, I've, I've had connections with Owen Mitchell for some time and also have been a past patron of the Mazik Foundation. So it's great that I've been asked to talk today. Um, and for those of you who know me, I'm uh, passionate to try and improve uh, inequalities throughout healthcare, but specifically the area of inequalities in maternity really got me uh, attracted to try and effect some change. Next slide, please. So this is what really attracts me to the issue. Now, this is the most up to date data, but I was vice president for clinical quality at the RCAG from 2016. And very clearly we were starting to get data through that showed uh, what was at the time the five times more uh, mortality of black women in pregnancy. And I saw this around the world. Um, I saw this in the States where actually in some states in the US, it's actually worse. Uh, I felt that this is not acceptable. 
But there is a wider problem here. Next slide, please. And it has been very eloquently put across by Sir Michael Marmot um, in, in his Marmot review, which the most recent one was 10 years after his, his first review. Next slide. Um, and and in, the, in that, the reviews I think many of us are familiar with, and that's give every child the best start in life, enable all children, young people, adults to maximise their capabilities and be in control, create fair employment and have good work for all, ensure a healthy standard of living for all, create and develop healthy and sustainable places and communities, and strengthen the role and impact of health prevention. Next slide, please. So this for me is one of those really groundbreaking slides because it shows that at the moment, this country from a, a, a spend per person is heading in the wrong direction. This shows cuts in council spending and the, the bigger the bar, the bigger the cut. And you will see that in the most deprived areas, they're getting the bigger cuts in spending. So something there is wrong. Next slide, please. If we look at the other thing in the Marmot review is about life expectancy. So life expectancy at birth, uh, is stalling. It was on a, a, a really good trajectory until about 2010, and you will see that it has fallen off since then. And, and I'll come back to the more recent data, but there are very significant differences in life expectancy depending on where you live in the UK. Next slide, please. For women, though, uh, life expectancy has declined and it continues to decline. Uh, and surely that shouldn't be right. Here we are in 2023. We should be having an improved life expectancy. And again, that life expectancy is very much related to the areas of, of deprivation in the UK. You see here from one of Michael Marmot's charts that in the most deprived parts of the world, your life expectancy is a lot less than in, in, in the least deprived. Next slide, please. Um, and yes, it's related to income, as Marmot shows, but it, he also shows it broken down uh, by different ethnic groups. And you can see here that individuals living with less than 60 percent of the median outcome, um, whether you look before or after housing costs, there are huge uh, racial inequalities there. And that uh, needs to be considered. Next slide, please. And poverty rates, so poverty rates by ethnic background, disability and sex. And you can see here that the poverty rates, uh, whether you're disabled or not, are much lower in the white groups than in the black and ethnic minority groups. Next slide, please. So much more recent data from my uh, colleagues in the public health team in the east of England, where I now work. Uh, you can see that there is very much uh, regional variations on neonatal mortality in the most recent uh, data from the Office for Health Improvement. And you can see that the West Midlands uh, is much, much worse than the Southwest. And my region is, is, in, is in the middle there, but still uh, it, there is very clear uh, geographical differences. Next slide, please. But as an obstetrician and gynaecologist, and certainly as someone interested in perinatal uh, mortality, morbidity and safety and maternity as a whole, Embrace are the group that really are at the cutting edge of providing the data that we can rely on and we can use to plan the care and show whether we're getting better or whether we're not. And um, and if you haven't read one of their Saving Lives, Improving Mothers Care reports, I really recommend that you do. They contain everything that you need. But with regard to this particular area, next slide, please. Um, I see things of concern. If we look at the maternal mortality rates, and I've just picked on this as one illustration, you would hope that things are getting better, but they're not. Those inequalities from perhaps the most reliable sources of data that we have in the UK are continuing to widen. And this means that the focus really needs to be sharpened. Next slide, please. Perinatal mortality. So if you look at the Embrace um, publications that look at perinatal mortality, you will see over the years the development of the difference in, well, not the development, the existence of the difference between white, mixed race, Asian, um, black, black British um, groups in the UK. And you'll see that disparity in perinatal mortality as well as maternal mortality 
exists. And so therefore, this again is an area that says we need to focus. And this very much drove me to do uh, a lot of the work in the RCAG that I, I will talk about later. But let's take apart the effect of ethnicity on perinatal mortality a little bit. Next slide, please. So I love the way, way that, that the um, Embrace group put together infographics. They really help understanding. And I'm very grateful to Marion Knight and her team uh, for letting me use these slides today. But you will see on these slides that the, the way they've demonstrated is with stillbirths and with neonatal deaths, you've got the headline figure that stillbirth rates for black and black British babies are over twice those for white babies and neonatal deaths at 60% more likely. So you can see by the different groups here, the smaller the square, the higher the risk. Um, and, and stillbirths and neonatal deaths very much reflect the maternal mortality picture and the perinatal mortality picture. Now let's look at the influences um, on that. So uh, next slide, please. So we put in deprivation. So deprivation, similar thing here, the smaller the square, the higher the risk. So the more deprived you are, the greater the chance of being stillbirth uh, and the greater the chance of um, ex experiencing a, a neonatal death. So twice the higher risk of stillbirth for women living in the most deprived areas. Next slide, please. But there is a Venn diagram and that Venn diagram really shows that this is it's not just one thing. It's a, it's a whole complex area of deprivation, ethnicity and indeed maternal age. I haven't really got time to talk about that today, but that does have an impact on this. And we will cover that um, slightly in, in this next slide. Um, and in, in this slide, I hope I've got the right one, please. Yep. So we have a summer evidence to show that with stillbirth rates and there are lots of other slides that um, that embrace provide here but with if I've, I've just taken stillbirth rates and we've looked at ethnicity uh, and different age groups as well and and here we have that the darker the slide the higher the mortality rate and so if you look at the the white age groups so the, the if white age groups that and sorry and again the smaller um the so the this is actually the bigger the, the bigger the square, the greater the mortality. Um, but none, nonetheless, you see here that the white age groups, the, the lesser chance of there being a problem is, is in the 30 to 34 um, age group with the least deprivation. And you see with the darker slide over in the in black women, 35 plus. Um, and again, and that's in the most deprivation. So again, a complex diagram but it gets across the really highly complex interplay between ethnicity, age and deprivation. I think Embrace has done an excellent job in getting, trying to get this across to people who are making decisions. Next slide, please. So bringing, bringing those, those issues all together, you can see that from, from a low stillbirth rate, you, if you're white, and as I said, in the age 25 to 34, in the least deprived, you're gonna have the lowest stillbirth rate. But the highest stillbirth rate is if you're black or Asian, you're over 35 and you are the most deprived. And that's a four times higher risk of stillbirth between those very focused down groups. So this publication really does help get down the, that interplay between the factors. Next slide, please. So here we have um, some data from my own region and thank you to the public health team there for, for supplying me with this. But this focuses it down on a regional basis and shows the sort of data that uh, that healthcare providers around the country can really nail down the, the, the detail in, in their region. So we see here the effects uh, of, of mortality, deaths of children aged 0 to 17. So this is a much greater age group than, than my talk today, but it shows that you can look at the impact on the most deprived and the least deprived. So really focus down in the areas. Next slide, please. So, I've shown you the data, but what's what 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 are the what are the causes? What's behind it? Well, if you look at the sort of very sort of um, uh, medical publications, as it were, with regard to maternity, we can look at pre-existing medical conditions. Um, can certainly have an influence. We know that different ethnic groups can have different. Uh, pre-existing medical conditions and also that can exist with um, different levels of deprivation. 
there's a very strong link between levels of deprivation, ethnicity and access to antenatal care, and that's been well explored. Uh, and of course, as Geeta was saying in her presentation, there are issues such as language barriers, being able to access care appropriately because through your issues with language, you don't un you don't know where help can be given. And a lot of the emphasis in the UK health system is about trying to improve access uh, through improving language barriers. Uh, next slide, please. But also there are there are other risk factors, and the, and again, thank you to the public health team uh, in the east of England. That it's not just about age uh, and ethnicity and deprivation. There are lots of other factors that actually come into play as risk factors, individual risk factors for infant deaths. And this is just a snapshot of them. But nonetheless, these are very relevant when it comes to having discussions with um, people who plan healthcare uh, to direct where healthcare improvement can happen. Next slide. But actually, is this the complete picture? Well, next slide, please. Here we go. Yes, another complex slide. But I think it's really important that we try and unpick these. Yes, I've said it's complex and there are lots of lots of factors, but we now go deeper into the health system here. So let's take women's health outcomes as, as, as the top here. So we have societal factors. So we have those structural dri drivers of health inequalities within society that I've talked a lot about today. And there's structural and societal racism, and that can affect disease exposure, but also the uh, approach to disease prevention and treatment. Then we've got the health system factors, and those for me, uh, when I was president, were the ones that I really wanted to, to, to dive into because they are things that, as health providers, that we, that we actually are closer to being able to influence and make change. So inequality of access and quality of available care. And that's where sharing good practice of, of addressing inequalities becomes really important between different health systems. There's the issue about academic research. I felt passionately that, that women aren't included in research in so many different areas. OK, women in maternity are included in research, obviously, because there's, there's no men doing maternity. But when we look at um, research for uh, into female health conditions, there's a much, much bigger need for um, research in women's health at full stop. And then we have issues about institutional racism. Um, certainly when I, I opened the Race Equality Task Force at the college, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, uh, that really opened the Pandora's box of uh, of many people who came to us with their stories of institutional racism um, and we've seen a lot in, in a lot of the the units that are uh, under the microscope around the uk for maternity problems that what quite often if care is delivered in an unkind and uncompassionate basis then women experience unkind care uh, and that's not what we want in the system and so if you've got a system that has institutional racism how do we know that it's not delivering racist care? And so that's to me really important that, that we that we iron out. And then there are the individu individual factors. I'm now just going to open up a little bit. So next slide, please. So women's outcomes, as we heard so strongly from Geeta, and I, I can't even really go there because she was so strong with that. Um, but th those shape the out women's outcomes. And so if we look at, we compare white women to women from black, Asian and minority ethnic groups, they're invariably younger, multiparous, and don't have a partner. We know they access antenatal care later. Antenatal care is a great opportunity for preventive care and also for improving outcomes during that pregnancy. So they have fewer antenatal checks, fewer ultrasound scans and less screening. And this is what um, the uh, National Perinatal Epidemi Epidemiology Units have shown. They've also shown women were less likely to receive pain relief in labour and were more likely to deliver by emergency cesarean section. And we should be asking why. We should be deep, uh, delving into much greater detail as to why this is the case. They have longer lengths of stay postnatally, more likely to breastfeed, but had fewer home visits from midwives. And to me, that does, just doesn't make sense. Why aren't they having the same number of home visits? And they were less likely to feel spoken to so they could understand, be treated with kindness and be sufficiently involved in decisions and have confidence and trust in the staff providing their care. And that's the case of, of Rane that Gita talked about. Next slide, please. But so why did they have those experiences? So 
ask them what what was the problem so they feel that they don't feel cared for in the same way sub themes of expectations of care and policies and rules and organizational pressures including staff attitudes and communication wanting to feel believed uh, wondering whether is the hospital a safe place were their choices denied and that they would have felt better managed for if they if they were um, managed in a sensitive and supportive environment and also stereotyping uh, needing to improve the quality of care. Next slide, please. And there are assumptions. There are many assumptions, I think, that come into the care of women from different ethnic groups. And I think that's led to a lot of the consistent seeing that we have that they report uh, poorer care. And lots of assumptions that have led to, I think, some things that we should consider uh, something possibly we should be ashamed of, that new immigrants are often healthier than their second and third generation descendants who've been in the UK for those generations. Even if you adjust for education and other markers of socioeconomic status, black women still experience poor maternal health outcomes. And these social determinants of health that I talked about at the beginning, I don't think fully explain a lot of persisting healthcare inequalities. And those, I think, come down to the structural parts of the health system that we can do something to change. Next slide, please. The Health and Social Care Committee in 2021 have said that the government needs to commit and it needs to commit properly. And they put recommendations forward that the government as a whole should introduce a target to end the disparity in maternal and neonatal outcomes. Next slide, please. So what are we doing about bringing uh, change to this environment? Next slide, please. So I set up the RCG Race uh, Equality Task Force when I started as, as president. And that was a, a, an amazing thing to do. We wanted I wanted to look at, at um, the issue of women's health outcomes, but also wanted to look at the way that the RCOG itself worked, the policies and strategies it had. And as I said to you earlier, the training and careers of obstetricians uh, and gynecologists to make sure that uh, if, if there is racism or lack of recognition of different uh, races, cultures and ethnicities, that this was embedded within the way that the, the college functions. Next slide, please. And we have the most amazing engagement from all across um, different uh, groups within the health system, but also we had fantastic uh, voices. And just one of the organisations that joined us was uh, Five Times More, who were fantastic contributors to that and you see we even had uh, Vanessa Kingori from Vogue who, who joined us with who is a, 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 we all know is a fantastic advocate in this area. We came up with some bold recommendations to begin with. Next slide please. Uh, um, and, and I'm ashamed, unashamed in, in putting forward some bold uh, recommendations and we wanted a call to act from the government. We wanted the government to commit to an independent review of maternal mortality and disparities. We wanted a commitment to robust reporting, and I think we're getting that now. We wanted a commitment to ring fence funding and a commitment to addressing the, sh the social drivers. So, so big, big calls. Next slide. Uh, we also work with five times more to come out with five steps for healthcare professionals. So the sort of things that health healthcare professionals can meaningfully do at home in their workplace. Um, simple but straightforward things that actually can really make a, a, a big difference. Next slide, please. Uh, and we use the power of advocacy in the communications and external affairs team um, at the RCOG and thank you to them for all the work that they did because that really did uh, raise the issues quite significantly. Now, the, the Race Equality Task Force, I, I feel, um, has probably had perhaps the biggest uh, impact and, and the RCOG are very much watching uh, what happens in the NHS from now on, because the NHS, uh, a lot of you will be aware of, have launched a programme called Core 20 Plus 5. Next slide, please. Um, and apologies for this complex slide, but it is an NHS uh, England slide. And it talks about core 20 plus five. Now the core 20 is the target population. So looking at 20% of the population, um, aiming to reduce inequalities in that area. 
um, and we're looking specifically at the key areas of health inequalities. And I was so pleased to see that one of the national focuses of inequality is maternity, also severe mental illness, respiratory disease, early cancer diagnosis and hypertension, along with smoking cessation, which has been one of those areas for quite some time. Um, but the key thing here is that these five areas include maternity and nothing um, made me feel happier than when this was published because it really put maternity up there as one of the areas that the government is committed to move on um, and we must always continue to remind the government that that is one of their foci. Now I actually work for NHS England now so it's part of my job to deliver this and I'm very happy with that it's the right sort of challenge that I should have. Next slide. So let's just explain that a, a little bit more. So, the, so the, the core 20 plus, so each integrated care system, so you will know there are 42 integrated, integrated care systems in England, and they can choose um, five clinical areas as, as well as the core 20, and that's an important thing. But for maternity, the specific line here is that uh, it's ensuring con continuity of care for women from black, Asian and minority ethnic communities and from the most deprived groups. So that uh, sort of embeds uh, minority ethnic communities and the most deprived groups as those groups needing a, a significant level of focus. And before that's implemented, it needs appropriate staffing levels. And we have about to be published in the next few days, the long term workforce plan for the NHS, and that will uh, enable a lot of what what is in core 20 plus five. But my teams, um, uh, sorry, my team, my team in my region, but also teams around the UK are working on this already. Next slide, please. What's really important here, though, is that the core 20 plus five actually um, aligns with the three year delivery plan for maternity and neonatal services. So that was published in March 23, so just a couple of months ago. And it's really important that uh, a major piece of work such as Core 20 plus 5 actually aligns with the plan that's come out because that plan for maternity has addressing inequalities as one of its key foundations. And it, as you all know, it's a, it's a really big ambitious plan. We have a great team uh, in NHS England to deliver that from the maternity perspective and that's looking at personalising care um, as a key thing and we're going to hear more about personalisation and choice over the next few days but also improving equity for mothers and babies uh, and as, as I've said um, that the key thing was to look at uh, the, the at-risk groups but really also to reduce inequalities for all in access, experience and outcomes and to target support where health inequalities uh, exist in line with the principles of proportionate universalism, but also to ensure that services listen to and work with women from all backgrounds to improve access and plan and deliver personalised care and to employ the existing uh, maternity and neonatal voice partnerships as well as other groups to ensure that everybody is heard. Next slide, please. Uh, and this is really a, a, a three year plan and it's been divided up into the sort of response who should deliver what. So integrated care boards, they have significant responsibilities as they develop um, and they have to publish and lead implementation of the local maternity and neonatal systems equity and equality action plans and also commission those uh, maternity and neonatal voice partnerships to do, reflect the ethnic diversity across their populations. And NHS England, our responsibilities, my responsibility in region is to make sure that that support is given to the ICBs um, and, and the region more widely and to oversee pilots. So I have a fantastic maternity team in, in my region who are ready to, to to oversee that and also a national review of health and social care women social women in prisons which is really important and the system to analyze this progress so the CQC have maternity survey survey data as many of you will know HSIB are now moving into CQC so that family involvement in reviews of ad adverse outcomes but to continue to really look at that national data as it matures over the years because I don't want to see that those gaps widening anymore Next slide, please. 
So, I mean, really, in summary, this is an incredibly complex area. There's that I showed you at the beginning, that complex interplay between ethnicity, age and deprivation. I think we're united. There is no single solution here, but we should be cognizant of the fact that the most current data we have uh, does not show that the situation is getting any better and we must move to a position where it starts to improve. The RCAG sharpened its focus uh, and brought people's attention to the issues through its work in the Race Equality Task Force. There are, there are many other incredible areas such as the Race Health Observatory doing work in this area, uh, patient groups doing fantastic work in this area. The NHS through sharpening its focus, I believe should harness all that power out there to really make sure that we stop this gap from widening. We recognise that everyone has a role to play here. And I leave, as Eddie Morris tends to, uh, a bit of a question in the room, maybe a little grenade is, should we ask the government as part of the NHS 75th anniversary to commit to a target that has power and has meaning? I might get in trouble for setting that target or setting asking that question, but I think it's it, it, it wouldn't be responsible for me to have talked about this and not suggest that that at the end. So thank you very much indeed for listening and thank you again for inviting me to talk. I'm very happy to take some questions. The building on the right here is the Royal College, the RCAG in London SE1. And the rather dull looking building on the left, which actually is a beautiful uh, building, is where I work now, Fullborn in Cambridge. Thank you very much, um, Eddie, for your um, talk and um, actually um, sharing with us the huge amounts of research that's been done in this area. Um, I, I personally didn't appreciate how many studies has, have been done. so. Um, I think it's helpful to see the research. However, um, as a practitioner, um, how do you think you're going to be able to reach these affected groups? I, I think a, a lot of this, uh, as I said, um, in the work that we did with the RCAG was um, asking the questions to the right groups. We found when, when I was talking about racism that um, my colleagues uh, working in obstetrics and gynaecology and indeed maternity widely, including our, our midwifery team members, um, stories of racism at work came out. And that's enabled a focus for the, for the RCOG um, to, to help support these people, but to devise an action plan whereby we can start to affect change. And that show by asking the right people the right question, we can actually start to make change. And I think that can be very easily paralleled through um, user groups. So we have the local user groups, as I talked about, the local maternity and neonatal systems that have excellent local uh, groups. So we find the local problems that are leading to um, local inequalities. Um, but I think it's also really important to involve the national groups who really have their finger on the pulse and can um, provide answers to the questions. We, but we do have to ask the right questions as well. And that's where the data comes in. It really helps us to be able to focus down and ask the correct questions. Gita, can I move to you now, please? Um, thank you so much for sharing your story. Um, and I hope it helps people to um, talk to others about getting some support, particularly from the MASIC Foundation and people like you. Um, We've had a, a question um, from the audience, which is about the use of local faith groups um, and whether local faith leaders could provide more education to parents um, and whether they could help uh, be a trusted place for providing information. Do you have a view about that? Uh, thanks, Michelle. Um, yes, I think it would actually be very effective engaging faith leaders or leaders of the community and I think it's actually essential in diverse communities. Um, at Mazit we're setting up national support groups for women with OAC and we're doing that in either local places of worship or in local hospitals so that we can access injured women to provide support and it would be wonderful if we could you know engage further with community leaders to disseminate information about the support groups or to even attend the support groups because I think that would then give women from communities 
where incontinence is a taboo subject, permission to talk about it and also then to engage with support. So yeah, I think that's a that's a great idea. Um, Eddie, you talked you talked about the interaction between um, age, social background, ethnicity, how they were all interacting together. Um, from a sort of geographical perspective, obviously the country is split into very different groups. Do you have any any views about how um, we can actually affect change here? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, and I think this is where, for once, an NHS reorganisation could be used um, to to improve care. Um, one of one of the things that has has really struck me since I've come into my, my new role is the fact that um, our public health colleagues have access to the most incredible data. And actually, we all do. Um, and it's quite often the case that these things are sitting on the Internet and, and you don't know that they're there. So if anyone's interested who, who's listening in, there's a thing called the health index. And when you when you drive when you dive deeply into the data for the health index, there is a, a, an enormous richness of information broken down by pretty much parliamentary wards. Um, uh, and you can look and see the impacts. So you can see the deprivation indices there. You can see the effects that um, deprivation has on quite a lot of, of significant healthcare outcomes. And, and I know for a fact that the integrated care systems within my region are really using that to drill down on how they can focus their priorities uh, in directing care appropriately. So I, I'll give you an example, and I, and I don't think my colleagues in the Cambridgeshire and Peterborough integrated care, integrated care system would would object to this, but um, Cambridgeshire and Peterborough are two are one integrated care system, but it divided it, it, so they're poles apart from uh, a, a social deprivation perspective. So you've got Cambridge, which is just fantastic in terms of uh, of financial support and, and, and a lack of deprivation. But then you go north into their ICS and the deprivation there is significant and you see the impact of that on numerous health outcomes. And so I think that the power of having that data available, as well as the power of, uh, of people in those areas, means that first you go to those areas and listen and find out what the problems are. Work with, as, as, we, as we just heard, the local faith groups, work with the local authorities uh, and work with the local care providers to find ways to meaningfully try and shift the dial on the gap in outcomes between those two areas. And I know that they are working on that. And I think if, if other areas like we saw the neonatal mortality in the northwest was enormous in comparison to the southwest. So find what the differences are, try and share the way that care is delivered to the benefit in, in, the, in the least deprived areas uh, and share that with those areas that are most deprived. So I think there are some tools existing in the system uh, along with um, changes to how um, the focus has shifted through the core 20 plus 5 that will make a big difference and hopefully end what to all intents and purposes is a bit of a postcode lottery. Thanks very much. Um, if I can just go back to you, Geeta, obviously as somebody who suffered from a, a, a traumatic delivery, you're also a solicitor. Are you able to explain to us if there's any form of legal redress if you have an injury like this? Yeah, there is sometimes, yes, although this very much depends on the circumstances. What we commonly see is OAC injuries that were preventable, um, sometimes tears that were completely missed, such as Rani's case where fourth degree tear was missed, um, or sometimes poor surgical technique at the first repair, um, which is something um, I went through because uh, secondary repairs are, are, are less likely to be successful. Um, so experts review the treatment and then the court applies a, a standard of reasonable medical care. So it's what the professional says is acceptable care. But what a lot of these cases come down to are issues I feel to do with training, which is what Mazik and, for example, the OAC care bundle are, are trying to change in, in maternity care. Um, 
But in circumstances where there have been errors, these can cause, as I, as I mentioned, you know, devastating and lifelong injuries. So to be able to secure compensation, to be able to access treatment or psychological input can have a hugely positive effect on the long term outcome for these women. Thanks very much, uh, Gisa. We've also um, we've also got a question which was uh, pre-submitted actually, which is what would have made the biggest difference in your care or treatment to you personally? I don't know if you're able to share that with us. Yes, of course. Um, thanks, Rochelle. Um, and thank you for the question. I think antenatally, having been told of my increased risk of away C as an Asian female having her first child. Um, would have made a, a huge difference rather than, you know, my antenatal classes focusing on what happens when the baby comes, such as breastfeeding, you know, because if you don't have a safe and supported delivery, it affects everything that comes afterwards. And, you know, I strongly believe that we need to empower women in childbirth by giving them information so they can make safe and informed choices. You know, long gone are the arguments that women need to be protected from too much information because, you know, it will scare them. Information is key, really. Um, also, for me personally, having a, uh, a, a good primary repair um, would have made a huge difference because it's much harder to um, repair sphincter injuries in secondary surgeries. Um, and also having a clear pathway for referral and treatment. As Eddie was saying, you know, it's still a postcode lottery. Um, and unfortunately, you know, there aren't clear pathways for referral to perineal trauma units, which is something, again, the Mazic Foundation is, is trying to look and map out. Thanks, Gisa. Um, I think we're, we're nearly at time, unfortunately, after such a great presentation today. But we've got one last question which relates to fathers. Um, we've seen a lot of research about uh, mothers, but actually there's also a significant impact on fathers when women suffer from a birth trauma or there is a stillbirth, etc. Um, do you think there should be more research and support for that, um, Eddie? I do. Um, it, it's an area that is, is very un understudied. Um, understandably, I guess we've uh, we talked about the focus being to for, towards women and women's health outcomes and outcomes in babies, but um, the, the father standing by watching an unfolding really difficult situation um, can suffer significantly from this. Um, there have been some studies um, and also there are some um, uh, maternity and neonatal voice partnerships in the UK that in, include uh, dads. Um, and so that can be that can be very helpful. Um, but doing more research in this area, I think, could be very illuminating. It would certainly help see the areas that um, units in this country could make sure that fathers are included when perhaps they're, they're not traditionally. As a whole, though, the health system is trying its best much more than ever to include uh, partners or birthing attendants uh, in all the discussions and to make sure that everybody's involved in the room and any and in any decisions that are being made. I just wanted to bring Geeta in because obviously your work from the Mazic Foundation, do they also support fathers when, when these terrible situations happen? Thanks, Rochelle. Um, yes, it is something that the uh, Mazic Foundation are, are, are looking at. Um, but yeah, I mean, from my own personal experience, you know, women going through the way the injuries occur following generally an extremely traumatic delivery. So very much so, as Eddie was saying, you know, partners, husbands in the room, you know, are, are do suffer also from post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and it's and and it's a very and, and would the women suffer from what's called postnatal uh, post-traumatic stress disorder? Um, you know, um, so it really affects relationships. We see a lot of women where there's relationship breakdowns following OAC um, and the women who suffer from these injuries aren't able to access the psychological input that they require. So, yeah, I mean, there's a huge gap in providing um, support for, for men um, who've been who've been through this as well, who've been witness to this. 
Thanks very much, Geeta. Um, I'm sorry to say that we're at time because it's been such an interesting um, afternoon. Um, I'd just like to thank you both for spending your lunch time um, sharing your story and also all the research, um, Eddie, um, and what's going to happen in the future. I think um, hopefully we can see some a lot of positives coming out um, from 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 both of your work. Um, I just would like to also share that the Health Inequalities series at Owen Mitchell is um, a five part series. We've already had three uh, with the one today. Um, this slide, which is also in your Q&A, um, has all the information about the future presentations. Um, we, all, we have one relating to cancer um, and diabetes, which um, are coming up in the next two months. So the information will be available to you and how to register. If you missed the, the previous um, talks, then you can also get the recordings. Um, and I'd like to thank you for joining us today and I hope you have a good afternoon.